Evening ladies and gents, it's Simon Brown here, uh, not doing this evening's presentation. Keith McLachlan will be doing it, uh, talking solvency. We're continuing on in those four legs of, of, of fundamental analysis. Remember, you can find Keith at smallcaps.coza. He does a blog update in the small and mid-cap sector about once a day on average. And, of course, you'll also find him at Tebis Securities, where he's a senior equity analyst. Over to Keith. Hi, guys. Thanks, thanks for joining me uh, this evening. Uh, we've been looking at a series on fundamentals, equity fundamentals. Um, I put them in four pillars, profit, profitability, solvency, liquidity, and management. Uh, we previously had, had a look at profitability, the motive for business, liquidity, cash is king. Um, this evening, we, we're having a look at uh, solvency. Very simple, debt and how it plays in the business. So simply, let's start off with uh, defining solvency. Uh, simply, simply put, solvency is the ability of a business to meet its uh, maturing debt obligations as they fall due. In other words, pay your debts, pay your loans as they fall due. Um, a business is solvent when its assets exceed its liabilities. Notice the interaction between assets and liabilities there. I'm going to move on to the next slide because assets less liabilities is equal to equity. Um, notice how, now, assets less liabilities, is, uh, we left with what we call the residual interest in a business, otherwise known as equity, which is shown in this equation. Do you notice how the liabilities interacts with that? Uh, on another topic, this is actually what we call the accounting equation. And if you ever wondered where debits and credits come from, it comes from this equation. But that's, uh, you can Google that. Uh, that's not what this webinar is about. So in conclusion, really, solvency and equity are directly interlinked. Um, both of them are funding the business, and they land up in assets. And assets generate the profits, and profits is the motive of business. So hence, liquidity is... Uh, oh, hence solvency, sorry, is quite important. So defined, def we've defined solvency, but solvency is really um, uh, just a big word for saying how much debt is in the business. Uh, now we need to know what exactly is debt in order to identify it. So let's start off with debt and start off with the riskiest, most expensive types and work down. Simply put, the riskiest, most expensive type of debt is the overdraft. It's expensive, first of all, the interest charge is very high, um, it's very risky, and this is, this is the point I want to linger on, it's callable on demand. Um, callable on demand means essentially on Christmas Day, just as you're cutting the turkey, you know, your banker can phone you up and say, I want that overdraft, pay it now, or we, you know, we, we taking, taking you to the courts and uh, filing bankruptcy, liquidating you eventually, potentially. Uh, so, so overdraft, in my opinion, is actually often part of liquidity, not actually debt. Uh, and, it's, and it's most unfortunate when some businesses fund themselves permanently in overdraft because the question has to be asked is why don't you formalize that debt uh, rather than leaving it callable on demand. What I mean by formalize it, I mean turn it into a term loan. There's the other type of uh, debt. First of all, it's slightly cheaper. Uh, because the bank has has less risk than overdraft, um, they they you know they they can manage their liquidity better, they they can manage their credit risk better, they can offer it to you on better terms. So first of all, it's slightly cheaper than overdraft. The interest expenses less. Second of all, it has fixed repayment terms, and I cannot emphasize that point more as opposed to overdraft. Fixed repayment terms mean I borrow a million rand, I say to my banker, I will pay you back a hundred thousand per month for the next 11 months. He makes his interest on that, I make my, uh, you know, I can budget my cash flows. It is not callable on demand. This is really and truly part of debt financing. It's the most common type of corporate debt, but it takes n numerous forms. You can get floating interest rates, mean they, they, track, uh, they track the interest rates in the market, fixed interest rates, you know, they fixed. You can you can get the sh uh, loans that are only 12 months. Oh, also interesting, the difference often between liquidity and loans is defined by liquidity. Um, you have to pay within 12 months. Long uh, non-current or or long-term debt tends to be payable in, in a time period beyond 
12 months. Notice how overdraft is callable on demand, hence, once again, it impacts on liquidity. Now, term loan would typically be structured, um, payable over many years. Uh, depending on the size, depending on the interest rates, um, you know, depending on what exactly is funding, uh, it's it can take many different forms and actually probably uh, you know Pareto principle 80 20 80 percent of the debt you'll look at will be a term loan um, so you understand that is the core part of financing there are other types of debt though much more formal uh, paper can be issued um, bonds debentures and if it comes from a government and, and the guys are old school they call it guilt uh, but particularly, we're looking at equity fundamentals, so that they tend to term it bonds and debentures. Now, both of these are even cheaper than a term loan, partly because their terms are more formalized, and partly because of the second element I, I will talk about in a moment called the senior debt and preferential terms. So they tend to be cheaper. They're also have fixed repayment terms. But now, this is the critical distinction between just a normal loan and a bond in the venture is that senior debt um, status. Senior debt status means, well, if, if you have um, a term loan, it says pay us before you pay the shareholders. If you have a bond or debenture, it says pay us before you pay even the term loans. They are senior debt. If a company gets wound up, these are the first boys at the table to get the payouts. That's what a senior debt really means. Preferential terms, bonds and debentures, they, 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 can, they can even, you know, to a large extent, you, you, you can argue they're part owners in the business because these are often these are un, um, you never have the principal paid back. They can be per, uh, perpetually funded. Uh, that's if they're unredeemable. Um, but these guys take, take, it's very important to understand um, that these are very formal and um, issue, issue debt. They, they tend to be longer term. I mean, you, if you're doing a 100-year mine, you tend to match that mine with equity, and then you want to gear that equity to get, to get a, a higher profit, so you bring on uh, bonds and the benches. Uh, term loan, you, know, it, it would, you, you wouldn't find a 100-year term loan or something like that. So un understand the different roles in the uh, in, in the financing structure, but it takes me to, to uh, preference shares. Now, preference shares, I've included them in our discussion of solvency, but depending on the specific terms of a preference share, they can also be equity. I, I had a client uh, a week or two ago ask me, what exactly are preference shares? The problem is there is no precise definition other than there aren't ordinary shares. Simply put, a preference share can take any form depending on how the company's structured the contract. It's simple. It's, an, it's exotic. You can have redeemable, unredeemable, cumulative, un, non-cumulative. You can have convertible, non-convertible. Um, and anything in between, uh, any, any combination thereof, you know, benchmark to, to, to the repo rates plus X, Y, Z. Hence, when you, when you have a look at a company, you have a look at the types of debts, uh, and you see preference shares sitting either in the equity or in the, or in, or in the non-current liabilities section. Go and read the fine print. Uh, go and decide for yourself exactly what these are and where they lie um, to understand the financing structure of the business, understand the risks to you as a minority shareholder in the equity. Um, my advice is it's simple. Depending on where the profit lies, the equity lies. So... If preference shares have greater exposure to the profits of the business, you could actually view them as a type of equity. If they have greater exposure, if if they don't, you know, if if, if your ordinary shareholders have have all the exposure to profits, then preference shares are actually debt. Um, so just have a look at who shares the upside risk or downside risk in, in the profitability of a business to understand exactly where preference shares land in the debt structure. Then finally, we get other types of debt. Now this is broad. They can go from banker acceptances to cross-financing structures to anything your imagination bankers and investment bankers, and trust me, they get commission out of it, so you, there's a lot of things that you got, uh, people can think of. Um, so, 
my advice is uh, when looking at a financing structure, this will this will tend to tend to lie in either the equity or non-current, sometimes even current liabilities section. If you see something you don't understand, go and read the notes in the financial statement. Go and make up your mind: is this debt? Is this is this just a liquidity, a short-term financing uh, arrangement? Make up your mind where it lies to understand the implicit risk in that business. So. We've looked at the definitions of solvency. Uh, we looked at w really what solvency is in the business, how it falls into the fundamentals. We've then uh, looked at different types of, because solvency is dictated by debt, so we looked at different types of debt. So here's a couple quick, dirty ratios you can calculate. You handed a, a set of financial statements. How much debt is on it? How much risk? What is the financing structure? Are you comfortable with it? These are really the questions that should be running through your mind when you see, when you're thinking about solvency and looking at financial statements. So we're going to have a look at a couple of major ratios you can crunch to see, see how it lies. First one is obvious. Debt equity ratio, the DE ratio. Simple. It's total debt divided by total equity. Um, this little uh, asterisk is simple. It means uh, I'm particularly talking about interest-bearing debt only. Um, if, if a shareholder loan, if there's a shareholder loan sitting in the, in the financing structure of the company, but it's non, uh, it's not bearing interest, it's it's probably just the founding shareholder trying to bail out his own company. And actually, you can view that as pot equity. Um, so, emphasize it again: interest-bearing debt only. So debt equity ratio is total debt divided by total equity. Gives you the split. If the company's wound up, which way is it going? How much risk is the you know, if 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 total equity is lying in a huge minority and debt is overpowering it, you know, depending on the business, there's probably probably problems there. But we've just looked at the, the liabilities and equity section of the balance sheet. In reality there's also the assets. So if a company is sitting with a huge amount of debt, but also a huge amount of cash, then theoretically they could just take their cash and settle the debt, or settle at least the cash's worth of that debt immediately. Hence we talk about, and there's a couple of ratios like this, we talk about the net debt um, ratios, in this case the net debt equity. It's simple, total debt less cash divided by equity. In my opinion, this tends to give a much more, a much truer reflection of the business um, in, in terms of financing and gearing risk and things like that. Um, that said, if you see a business sitting with a huge amount of cash and a huge amount of debt, the question has to be asked is why exactly aren't they settling their debt? Now, debt will tend to, even though debt can, can be cheap, it'll tend to be more expensive than interest earned on the cash balance. So surely you increase shell returns not by gearing in that situation, but by de-gearing, uh, i.e. paying back, the, p using your cash to pay off that debt. These questions have to be asked, but it's also got to view it in context. Other major ratios, debt to assets, it's simple, it's total, total debt divided by total assets. Um, this ratio is saying to me, for every one round of assets, how much of those assets is actually financed by debt? Um, how much of that rand is is debt as opposed to equity? Uh, once again, touching on that net net um, aspect, net debt assets. Uh, then we then we have a nice little interaction with uh, the uh, the income statement. Remember, if if you have a look at the profitability uh, webinar in the series, we can't we uh, had a very brief discussion on what we call financial leverage. Financial leverage. And, and this is the beauty of, of, of fundamentals, they all interact with each other. It's very hard to talk about them in isolation. So, interest cover directly impacts profitability, but the interest, interest cover is simple. It's profit before interest uh, and tax, PBRT, uh, divided by the net interest expense. What this is telling me is it's telling me how many times can the profit before interest and tax decline before the business isn't even covering the interest expense um, on their debt? Notice how debt creates the interest expense, profitability creates the profit before interest and tax. There's an interaction between profitability and, the, uh, and solvency there. So once again, just pointing out how the balance sheet 
where debt comes from, interacts with the income statement and profitability or profit before interest and tax, interacts with cash flow statement because net net debt involves cash. I mean when you your your base point when you look at a company should always be the financial statements. Uh, that's where you start. And the financial statements, the critical part is always the balance sheet, income statement, and cash flow statement. Hence, I keep on coming back to this principle um, because it, it, it's, it's where you get your information, it's where you get your numbers, where you understand the business. Um, and that, that's, that's just... Uh, I know it's, it's maybe redundant, it's maybe, getting, uh, maybe getting a bit irritating, but I'm just touching on it to reinforce the fact that your fundamentals tie straight back into your financial statements. So, okay, we've, we've had a look at uh, definitions of solvency, instruments, and then ratios to understand them. Now, fundamentally, let's take a step back. What really are the characteristics of debt in the business? Is it good? Is it bad? Do you want it? Don't you want it? Sim simply put, debt is cheaper than equity. may sound strange, but uh, try this logic test. If you really have a good business, and you bring in shareholders, you suddenly have to share your profits. If you, but if that business is really that good, actually, you just get you bring in you take a loan to fund it because you get all the profits and you just have to pay say ten, twenty percent on the loan or whatever. Um, so I get back to how debt is cheaper than equity because equity captures the upside. But um, let's let's formally talk about it. So. That's cheaper than equity because the um, debt, the shareholder or the, the equity only has to pay the contractual debt amount. In other words, it caps the, 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 the debt holder's upside. In that example, if your business is really good, my advice, don't issue equity, bring on debt. You get all the upside then. Finally, very subtle little distinction in the tax act, and tax is a real expense. I mean, you chop off... Uh, sort of 28% uh, of, of your profit and see how painful that feels. Um, so now, whereas you, equity is always after tax, debt is actually before tax. And in, in interesting enough, interest expense is tax deductible. So that means if you're paying 10% on, on uh, interest expense on, on a loan, in reality, after tax, you're only paying 10% less the 28% deduction you get of that interest expense. Another characteristic of debt, um, or touching on it, it's still cheaper than equity, is that uh, anything a company earns beyond the cost of debt is the shareholders. And hence, just reinforcing the fact that the blue sky upside is purely for the shareholders. That's why, once again, looking at those preference shares, figure out whether they're debt to equity or both to understand that, the real true cost of the financing structure. Um, sorry, just referencing the previous uh, webinars. Uh, debt debt uh, appearing the financing aspect of a business uh, is the positive aspect of financial leverage. Uh, have a look at the profitability webinar. We, we have a nice discussion of that. There, there's the link there. Uh, finally, another characteristic of debt is it may be cheaper than equity, but it's riskier. Why is it riskier? Simply put, the shareholders are contractually obliged to pay debt and its interest back. In other words, whereas debt has no upside in the business, all the downside of debt is absorbed by the shareholders if the business is unprofitable. That's negative financial gearing or leverage. Um, if you can't even make enough profits uh, to, to fund the debt, the debt will end up uh, li liquidating you in the form of a banker rocking up at your door with his lawyers. So, it's a negative aspect of financial leverage. Debt, is, you know, th th there's, uh, I've touched on the saying, but I'll say it again. It's still applicable in this case. If you have more cash coming into your bank account than going out, it doesn't matter what your profits are, you're still in business. In reality, well, if you have tons of debt and no profitability, eventually the debt's going to absorb the prof uh, that whatever marginal profitability you have, and you're going to go bankrupt. Debt creates bankruptcy.
If a company defaults, the holders of debt can potentially call for liquidation of a company. This is why I'm talking about not just solvency, but business risk failure in this, in this webinar. Because, strangely enough, without debt, a company will never go bankrupt. With debt, a company will. Um, what happens, actually I'll touch on that, but you may say, what about liquidity and creditors and things? Those guys, when you hit on it, uh, and they don't work, and you can't cover them, it tends to get capitalized as debt, and eventually uh, it, it, it exponentially expands into tons of debt, because you can't service anything, and the debt actually bankrupts you. But, uh, so, the question in your mind, I mean, I've said good things about debt, I've said bad things about debt. Um, you look at a company, how much debt? Do you want it in there? Do you want pure cash company? Do you want do you want a debt to get to get to the you know to the gills? Uh, so the question remains, how much debt? Now this is a theory slide, so I'm going to, I'm going to be talking theory here. Um, debt is cheaper than equity. So right from this part of the slide, we've got pure equity f financing. Um, as we go this way, you have more debt. Now, debt is cheaper than equity, so the more debt you bring on, the cheaper your total cost of funding. Total cost of funding we call the WAC. Sounds strange, it's an acronym for Weighted Average Cost of Capital. Don't get confused by that term, just think of it as the total cost of funding a company. Total cost of funding a company. So, as you bring on debt, it's cheaper than equity, your debt to equity ratio is increasing, your your WAC is dropping, your total cost of funding a company is dropping, but there is a point, there is a point where you you have too much debt. And as you bring on more debt, your business failure risk is increasing. In other words, if you were to issue shares at this point, as opposed to this point, the, share, the sh new shareholders coming in would say, ooh, you've actually got a lot of debt in that company. I want more aggressive pricing in order to assure that I'm, I'm balancing my risk to reward. Do you notice how as you bring on more debt past a certain point it actually increases the cost of funding. So this is what we talk about the optimal debt mix of debt and equity. Now this is beautiful, pretty slide, it's all great in theory. How does it actually work in practice? Now how it works in practice is case by case basis. Let me show you an example. Company A now, Company A is a risky business. It has less predictable cash flows. Um, perhaps it's a mineral exploration company. Um, it actually maybe doesn't even have revenues or cash flows. At this point, it's just spending money. So do you notice how equity starts off, you, your funding is fairly expensive. The amount of debt you bring on, the cost drops quickly, but then rises almost immediately. What this is saying, it, well, this is just a visual representation of how riskier companies with less predictable cash flows can actually afford to have, or they actually can't afford to have a lot of debt. Hence, your optimal amount of debt is little to none. Company B, on the other hand, is a very safe company. Very predictable cash flows, uh, perhaps it's a retailer like pick and pay, perhaps, you know, it could, could be a range of things. Comfortable, steady business coming in through the door, profitable business coming in through the door. Hence, it can, it can start to lay on tons of debt because it can service all that debt, service all that debt. Keeps on just dropping that, uh, dropping a cost of, uh, cost of funding, the whack, the whack just keeps on decreasing. You notice how it can, like, the safer a business is, the more debt it can afford to bring on, but the more debt it brings on, the more it gears shareholder returns. You notice how we're still dancing around this risk to, risk to reward equation. So, once again, the question of how much debt depends on the company. Case by case basis. Understand the risk and the cash flows in the company and you understand where the optimal amount lies. Make a judgment. So, with debt comes business failure risk. If you have a profitable business, you start to grow it, you start bringing on debt, you you, you start to um, risk failure. Well, I mean, if you don't have a, a profitable business, you don't actually have a business. So we, first of all, working with the assumption that the business is actually inherently profitable. Second, second thing is looking at it, 
it's listed, you, you're analyzing it, um, you want to know when, when are things going wrong, really? That's what business failure risk is. Um, and when is the risk against you as opposed to in your favor? Look at the interaction between profitability, liquidity, and solvency. If there's no profit, there's no business. As I said, you know, you failed before you began. Next step, bad liquidity. Bad liquidity eventually, you know, you can't pay your uh, creditors, you start, you start uh, drawing your overdraft to pay your creditors. That overdraft starts to become expensive, you formalize overdraft uh, because it's callable, it's risky, so you formalize it as a term loan. Ooh, the term loan, you can't service it. The term loan expands and compounds, and eventually a term loan liquidates you. Notice how bad liquidity eventually turns into increasing debts. Too much debt, increased risk. You go bankrupt. But also, all of this, bear in mind, uh, sounding like an economist here, I'm contradicting myself, but too little debt, you can also have artificially low shareholder returns. Depends on the business, case by case basis. Um, so, sorry, yeah, just touching on it. Too much debt, increased risk, eventual bankruptcy, unless you're profitable. Profitability, that's why all the fundamentals continue to interact with themselves. Some more symptoms of uh, business failure risk. Yeah, it's simple. Uh, remember we looked at uh, we looked at profitability uh, webinar. We looked at inputs and outputs into the income statement. There's only one real input. The major input, the driver of the business, remains revenue. But if revenue is declining year on year, some serious questions have to be asked. Profitability cannot cannot go anywhere except south if revenue is declining. Revenue might be growing, but margins are declining. And there's not revenue is an ego figure. I want remember the motive of business is profits. If revenue is is growing, but the margin declining, your profits will actually probably be declining. Hence, declining profits year after year shows lack of compa uh, competitiveness shows all sorts of problems happening. Business failure risk increasing, rising debt levels and dropping cash and profitability. In other words, it's becoming harder and harder to service that debt until eventually you aren't servicing that debt and you get liquidated. Rising business failure risk. Eventually, here's a subtle one. A dividend suddenly gets suspended. Now, dividends are, are cash flow paid to shareholders out of profits. So, if a dividend gets suspended, it's essentially a vote of no confidence in the future profitability of the company and this is a really really good reason justifiable reason and that reason actually ends up to be truthful um, dividends being suspended is definitely a red flag so more um, th there's a fairly long list so I'm just chatting chatting away through it but uh, n another one if you see a business a big group suddenly selling its core assets you know they're selling their family silver Questions have to be asked. Wow. And often often the argument is we've brought on too much debt. And that's uh, often a legacy of too much acquisitive growth or tons of problems, uh, or too much debt uh, incurred. It's simple. They need to liquidate. Um, and either you get, your, you get your debtors to liquidate you, financiers to liquidate you, or you liquidate. You pay that debt and then decide where to go. Um... Also, a company is starting to issue equity to keep itself afloat. That last term is, is quite important, to keep itself afloat, because you, a lot of companies list um, because they want to uh, issue equity, they want to finance projects, and they want to grow. Now, growth is great. I, I can put money into a company growing. I've got no problem with that. A company doing a right issue when it's seriously in trouble, that right issue has to be viewed in the context of debt. If, if a company's prospects were safe, they wouldn't do a rights issue. They would raise debt because then they get all the upside. Issuing, issuing equity says to me, in, in this situation when a company's in trouble, it says to me that you that there is actually no upside and you want me to share in the downside. Just worth thinking about. We maybe touch on this in later. Um, or in question session. Finally, 
directors leaving and not being immediately replaced. I mean, directors leave, everybody has the right to move labor, should be mobile. Um, that's good. That's how you do efficient uh, resource allocation in, in, in the economy. But if they cannot be immediately replaced, first of all, who's, who's, for, who's filling that gap? Second of all, um, you know, why exactly can't you replace that director? Why, why does nobody want to come on board? And then this goes on to the next bar is going to uh, show a lot of it. And it's simple. The theme remains the same. Rats jumping ship. The auditors resign with no reason. They no longer want to be associated with this company. Sponsors, designated advisors resign with no reason. They want to be associated with this company. Directors selling a huge percentage of their shareholding. In fact, maybe these are even the same directors resigning immediately. Rats jumping ship. Be very careful. I mean, each one of these events in isolation, not bad. But when all these events happen around about the same time, suddenly red flags should be going up. Um, fi finally, a bit of a vague point. Worsening management communication are key points. Our next webinar is, is going to be around uh, the final of the four pillars of fundamentals management. Uh, we'll have a long discussion on this. Um, but management is, is, is the custodians of capital. They direct the ship that is the, uh, that is the company. They direct it onto rocks. Um, you know, things are going to go badly. Even worse, they don't want to tell you when they've directed it onto rocks. You have to start questioning things. So worsening communication on key points. And we can go on and on. Um, there's tons of business failure risks, tons of signs. This is just a very simple list but by no means a complete list. Um, my, my advice is get into the market, understand it, view it, view it largely, uh, view, view it largely in, in, in signs of, uh, in, in, how can I put it, like a poker game, actually. Um, it depends on signals you get. Uh, and as you, play, as you play it more and more, and you invest more and more, you start to understand which are good signals, which are bad signals, and which signals are actually just noise. Uh, so business failure risks, just need to touch on it because solvency creates business failure risk, whereas as part of the funding structure, it also enhances business failure risk, or, but it can lower the cost, uh, cost of funding a business and uh, raise, raise the returns to shareholders, good and bad. So we've got all this background. How do you evaluate the debt in the listed company? Now you actually want the practical. Um, simple. Have a look at debt. Have a look at net debt for perspective. Compare debt levels to industry competitors. Uh, are they high? Are they low? Or are they in line? Does it feel comfortable? Are they comparable? Um, have a look at the interest cover on the, on the in, uh, income statement. Uh, this, this shows the financial leverage. Financial leverage is good and bad. Is the company growing, declining? Financial leverage on the growing company is good. Financial leverage on the declining company is bad. Financial leverage on the volatile company is good in good years, bad in bad years. View it in context. Then the question has to be asked because a balance sheet is, is a snapshot in time. That's all it is. It's literally what it closed on on the very last day of that financial year. So the question has to be, you can't, sometimes you actually can't view it just in that snapshot. You have to view the trend. The question has to be asked, you know, the financing structure of the company may be risky, may be not risky, um, less risky in between, you're comfortable with it, but are the debt levels increasing or decreasing? In other words, is that, is, if the company is ungeared, are they gearing up? May lower their cost of uh, their, their cost of funding. You know, they whack, increase their returns. But if the if the but, but, but if the company is very geared, it may push them into the business failure risk uh, a part of the quadrant where we, you know, we seriously start to question things. So view the trend of debt, not just in isolation, but view it in context. So all of it, all of this, really takes you to a conclusion. And that that conclusion is business failure risk. Do you think? business is going, is, is going down, going up. It's going to be profitable, it's going to be unprofitable, is, is risking uh, bankruptcy.
More importantly, do you think that they have an efficient financing structure? Efficient, efficient financing structure maximizes your returns as shareholder. All of, that, all of those questions, all of this understanding leads to that question. Are you comfortable with it? Are you not? So the conclusion, debt is a financing decision. Debt is cheaper than equity, but debt is riskier than equity. Hence, we look for the optimal emphasis on optimal funding structure. The optimal debt level also depends on the business. Riskier businesses, more volatile cash flows, you want less debt. Safer businesses, more stable cash flows, you can afford more debt. Maximize, squeeze out those shareholder returns. It's all about marginal returns. So the conclusion is, furthermore, increasing debt levels also has a trade-off with increasing increasing business failure risk. Uh, business failure risk is also real. Businesses go bankrupt. Don't think it won't happen to the companies you invest in? May well. It's reality. So watch for its symptoms and get out in advance. Sometimes those symptoms can be sorted out. The company can get back on its feet and carry on going. Rather be uh, proactive uh, than, than the guy, you know, the guy who tells a horror story about losing his investment portfolio because he invested fully in one stock that went bankrupt. Um, business failure risk is real, but it, its interaction with debt should be viewed like that. So that's uh, a fairly long webinar. Uh, I hope it's interesting. Um, I, th I think now is a good time to open to questions. Simon, I'm not, I'm not sure if we actually have any questions. Oh, thanks, guys. Um, next, next webinar is on management. Uh, Hope you join me then.